Hey gang, it's good to be back with you and today I've got a great topic. We're going to talk about biplanes. Now biplanes are any kind of plane that have two sets of wings, usually one on top of the other. These days you don't see biplanes very often, usually at air shows. Sometimes aerobatic pilots who fly in these, these stunt displays are flying biplanes. But in the early days of aviation, biplanes were where it was at. Most planes were biplanes. In fact, if you go back to 1903, the Wright Brothers Flyer, the very first uh, flyable powered airplane, was a biplane. So, what is it that makes a biplane interesting when we talk about statics? Well, let's draw a picture. Let's look at the biplane from the front. So here's the fuselage, and the fuselage is just the body of the plane. That's where the engine lives and the pilot and a bunch of other stuff. So a lot of times the fuel is in there. And here's a set of wings on the bottom. And then there's usually a structure here. I mean, a lot of times it's a steel tube structure. And there's a set of wings on the top. Okay, those little dots are important. Those dots indicate that this wing is pivoted there and pivoted there. Well, this isn't going to work. These, these they can just flop. Well, they're making a bunch of lift this way. How do they, how, how do you deal with that? Well, typically what they do is they have cables that go down here and go down here. All right, so this cable there and that cable there are in tension. Now let's, let's, let's make sure we know that these wings are producing lift. All right, so there we got that. So now this cable can be in tension and it can bear the load imposed vertically by that wing. So far, so good. What about that one? It, it can still just flop. There's usually a strut out here. In fact, almost always there's a strut out there. So this strut, which is solid, is in compression. Okay? It's, the wing pushes up against that strut, and the strut resists the, the uh, load of the wing there. So now this thing can fly. That's what a biplane could look like. But there's a problem. What if the load isn't always up? What if the pilot wants to fly upside down or maybe noses over so that instead of the lift going up, the lift goes down? Instead of the pilot being pushed down into his or her seat, they pull up against the straps. This happens. Now what? The way this works, this whole thing will collapse. Remember what the, one of the fundamental rules of statics is. You can't push a rope. Well, if the loads were reversed, if the lo lift was that way, the, these cables would just collapse and the wings would collapse. Well, we can't have that. That's no fun. So what do they do? Do you just make it so you can never fly upside down, so you can never pull negative G? No, that's not going to work. What they do is they put a second set of cables in that look like this. Right? Now you've got a structure that can bear loads that way and bear loads this way so the plane can fly right side up or upside down. So here's a modern example. This little red biplane is a plane called a Pitts Special. P-I-T-T-S Special. And it was designed a long time ago by a gentleman named Curtis Pitts. And this is one of the most famous aerobatic airplanes that's ever been built. Some of them are still in production. I believe there's a two-seat version still in production as I shoot this. Um, and there are uh, plans available. People still build these things. I don't know, you might even be able to buy kits or something for them. You can clearly see that the wings are braced by two sets of diagonal cables. Now, these are very high quality cables. These things cannot break because if they do, the wing will fail. These are, these are critical parts of the structure. Now the good news is that pit specials have a reputation for being extremely strong. There's not much you can do in the air to break a pit special. They're stronger than the pilot is. So there's what it looks like now. Well, what did it used to look like in the beginning? World War I started in 1914, and when the war started, aviation was very, very new. The Wright brothers had only flown 11 years before that, 
and we knew very, very little about how to make good airplanes. The early planes were very crude and they were very dangerous. People tried all kinds of different designs to see what worked. One of the first really successful planes was a German plane called an Eindecker. Eindecker translates roughly into single wing. It was a monoplane instead of a biplane. It had one set of wings instead of two. It was designed by a Dutchman, a very famous aircraft designer named Anthony Fokker. It's F O K K E R. So if you speak English, get the giggling out of your way right now. That's his name. I am pronouncing it correctly. And this plane was unique and had one set of wings, but the structure, the load carrying structure, was almost all outside the wings. Here's what one looks like. And you can see that there are cables absolutely all over the place. There is a pylon in front of the pilot and one below the fuselage with cables going to it. You can see that the cables going from the bottom of the fuselage to the wing resist loads that are in flight when the lift is up and the cables from the top of the pylon going down to the wing resist negative loads either when the plane is on the ground and the wings don't, aren't making any lift to support themselves or if the pilot pushes the stick forward or tries to fly upside down or something so the lift from the wings is down instead of up. The way this plane is built it's awfully hard to fly this thing upside down. One other thing to note about this plane is it doesn't have any ailerons. Those little control surfaces on the wing that allow the plane to roll, this plane doesn't have any. The reason it doesn't have any is these wings were designed to warp. When you move the stick side to side to make the plane roll, the wings actually warped just like the Wright Brothers wings did. And the way they pulled this off is that the wing has beams going down, it spars, but it has almost no torsional stiffness. And so the stick was actually connected to the, the cables, the wires that hold, held the wings. And those things actually moved differentially and warped the wings a little bit. Now this plane was not a particularly good plane in itself. It had one advantage. Anthony Fokker had designed what's called an interrupter gear. It was a cam that goes on the, I guess on the crankshaft probably, that set it up so that you could fire a machine gun through the propeller without hitting the blades. When the blade came by, the gun would stop shooting. And this allowed fighter pilots to aim their entire airplane and just pull the trigger. Before, people had been trying to put guns outside the propeller arc or make the guns move. Well, and that didn't work. The, the Eindecker was the first plane produced in any quantity that could do this. And uh, when it first came into service, there was something called the Fokker Scourge, because these things were shooting uh, Allied planes down left and right. Very quickly, the Allies responded with other planes. One of the most famous planes that in the, on the Allied side was a French plane called a SPAD-13. S-P-A-D is actually an acronym for the name of the company in French, but it's, everybody pronounces it SPAD. Here's a SPAD-13. You can see that this is a biplane and it has those cables we've looked at before, but there's one critical difference. The difference between this plane and the one I drew before is it has two bays on the wings. So let's just draw this again. Now we need cables again, right, and struts. Well, we, before we had a strut out here and a strut out here. Let's see, stretch that wing out a little bit. This one has two sets of struts. Now, the downside is there's a lot more stuff hanging out in the breeze. There's a lot more drag. But these planes didn't go that fast anyway. A really fast plane back then was about 120, 130 miles an hour. So that's what, 180, 200 or so kilometers an hour. And of course it had wheels and everything down there. One of the nice things about this design is that you could disconnect the wings from the fuselage, separate them, and they would stay in shape. There's enough cables in here and enough struts these things basically make a big box girder so you could work on the wings get them all lined up and then bolt them back onto the plane now this type of design hung on an awful lot longer than you would think the last operational plane i know of that was built this way was flown by the british it was a biplane they used as a torpedo bomber it had a torpedo under the plane and they would fly low over the water and drop this thing into the water and aim it at a ship. The plane is called the Ferry Swordfish. 
And Ferry, F-A-I-R-E-Y, was the name of the company. I think it was the last name of the, the founder or the designer. And the plane was called the Swordfish. And the pilots called it the string bag because you could see there's just cables all over the place. Here's a picture of one with the wings folded. Why would you fold wings? Well, this is an aircraft carrier. There's not a lot of room. If you go below the deck to the hangar deck, you're inside the ship now. The smaller you can make your plane, the, the better. The more of them you can stick under there, the, the easier they are to work on. Because that plane had this kind of structure, you could put an extra hinge there and just fold the wings back. Now the high point of the ferry swordfish, which I believe had a top speed of about 100 miles an hour, it's 160 kilometers an hour, was in the sinking of the German battleship, the Bismarck. In just absolutely horrible weather, a couple of ferry swordfishes with their little torpedoes found this ship, and one of them managed to hit the back of the ship and jam the rudder over. They were unable to fix the rudder, and then, of course, the British caught up to it and sank the ship. Okay, just to close out, We've had some nice descriptions here. Let's draw a free body diagram real quick, just to make sure we've got the, the ideas uh, solidified here. Let's just draw the free body diagram of that wing. All right. So let me erase all this stuff. Do a screenshot if you need to. Here's the wing. Okay. Just a beam. It looks like a beam from the front. Well, let's start thinking, about what, is, what are its end conditions? Well, its end condition is pinned here. Now, does that look like the rest of the plane? No. But this thing is symmetric. Whatever's going on on one side of the plane is going on the other. So ma mathematically, we really can treat this as a pinned boundary condition. We don't care what's going on over here. We just know it's not going to move. All right, so we've got lift over the wings. This is a distributed load. Now, for aerodynamic reasons, the actual load is, is closer to an ellipse, but this is close enough for what we need. Now, let's see if the, wind, the force is going up. We've got that cable going down. Okay, we've got a tension. We'll call that maybe tension one. Okay. So that cable is, is in tension helping uh, uh, restrain the wing. And we've also got that strut coming up from the lower wing. Okay, what do we want to call this? S1. There's the force in the strut. Hey, now we've got another one over here. Got a second strut. Now what about some of these other cables? What about these cables that go down there? Do, do those contribute to the lift? No, those things are in compression. Remember one of the cardinal rules of statics. You can't push a rope. So this is it. This is what holds that wing up. Now, as we looked at more and more of the structure, we'll draw more and more of these free body diagrams like this. And this is very similar to the type of calculations that went on when people designed these things a long time ago. So there you have it. We've had a little look into the history of uh, aviation, some aircraft structures, and how to design those structures, how to analyze those structures using statics. Hope this helps. We'll talk to you next time.